start. Okay. Welcome everyone to this webinar, which is being jointly organized by AGU, NCI, Oscope, TURN and ARDC. The topic of our uh, webinar is meeting publisher requirements for data samples, and um, notebooks. I'd like to thank ARDC for hosting us and providing the backbone. And for those of you, because we have some overseas people registered for this, the Australian Research Data Commons purpose is to provide Australian researchers with competitive advantage through data. And their mission is to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data sets. I'd like to uh, do an acknowledgement of country and those of us presenting acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. And for me, that is the people of the Ngunnawal country around Canberra. So just to give you an idea, we'll just have a short introduction. Then I'll hand over to Shelley and Chris from who have a lot, sorry, actually you have a lot of experience in um, fair publication requirements and not just in the earth sciences. We're cognizant that a lot of people from health have actually registered for this uh, webinar and bio areas and all sorts of areas. And also we have researchers here as well as those that offer research support. So we're cognizant of both types of people here. And so we want to speak to you as the researcher or research support as to how you can meet those requirements. And if you do it carefully, you can also increase your digital presence. For the second, for the half hour at the end, Natasha Simons as ARDC has agreed to step in and facilitate a um, forum on where you can tell us what you feel needs to be done to help you meet these requirements. What are your pain points? That is once Shelley and Chris have helped you understand what they are, what are the things that are currently um, stopping you and what can we do to help you? So if you could keep your questions about the publishing process to Shelley and Chris, but if you're having problems in Australia, you've got a half hour set aside for that. And then we'll do a quick wrap up. So I'm doing the introduction. And I just thought we thought we'd just introduce the speakers one after the other at the start so we can get the presentations to flow smoothly. So I'm Leslie Wyborn, I'm with the NCI Australian Research Data Commons, and I'm also chair of the Australian Academy of Science National Committee for Data in Science. And I just have this interest as a traditionally trained scientist that um, there's data and there's your conclusions and that you have to make your data available. And in this day and age, as it gets bigger and bigger, it gets harder and harder. So now I'll hand over to Shelley. Could you do a quick introduction, please? Yes, thank you, Leslie. And thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Chris and I uh, are incredibly delighted. So I am the uh, Senior Director for Data Leadership at the American Geophysical Union, and um, very excited to speak with you today. Hi, Chris? and I'm, uh, yeah, I'm Chris Erdman. I'm the uh, Assistant Director for Data Leadership. Natasha? Thanks, Leslie. I'm Natasha Simons. I'm uh, the Associate Director for Data and Services at ARDC, and I'm coming to you from Turbul and Yagara country in Brisbane. Thanks. Okay, so let's ask the obvious question. Why are we having this webinar? And recently there was a project funded by ARDC, NCI, Oscope and TURN called the 2030 Geophysics Collection in short. And it aims to build a high resolution geophysics reference collection for computation and wants to make high resolution data sets available for programmatic access in 2030, including um, AI and ML potentially at exascale. But as I said, this is not a geophysics seminar because we need to know what's going on in the physical sciences, the social sciences with their data so we can meet those transdisciplinary research challenges of the next decade, e.g. the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals. And we also want to go through this issue of I'm making it fair today 
will it be fair in 2030 if we want to use it as this system runs up? And there's more on this website page here. So here's the but, 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 but. We also know that researchers on this project need to survive in the here and now, and they have to publish. So what are today's requirements for publishing data samples, software, et cetera? And are we really making these fair in our current publications? Will the data in our publications of today be interoperable and reusable in 2030? Can we integrate with other disciplines? And above all, which is what I said, the last part of this webinar is about how can we make it easier for you, the researcher, and all those who are supporting the researchers to meet the challenges of fair publications of today? I just highlight that um, Shelley is an official advisor on the 2030 project. So those of you that are on that, we will still be able to tap into Shelley's expertise in the coming couple of years. So now I'd like to hand over to Shelley and Chris, and can you take it away and I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Leslie. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and pull my slides up. Chris and I have quite a lot to share with you today, and we will be uh, going back and forth in the in present uh, who's going to be presenting. So hopefully that will give you some variations. Uh, the the American Geophysical Union has had a position statement on data since the mid 1990s, with the most recent uh, version uh, updated in 2019, and very soon we'll go through another revision. It guides the AGU and the decision makers and leadership on everything that they do, uh, including our brand new strategic plan, which is really focused on uh, inclusive, inclusiveness and uh, collaboration, as well as open science and open data. Our, our data, our earth and space science data are a world heritage. Uh, this data needs to be uh, cared for and stewarded into the future in order to solve the very complex problems that we're dealing with today. Um, so we, what we do supports those goals. Um, and we're very pleased to have our, our leaders and our membership uh, uh, put together these position statements for us to follow and to support the community with. This, uh, this graphic is is fairly is, is really interesting and it's also kind of fun uh, when you get access to these slides i have the link to it in the notes uh, it's in in 2019 nature springer nature celebrated their 150 years and what they did is they took all of their publications and uh, mapped all of the references in order to show how science has built upon previous science. And one of the things I wanna to highlight to you, um, in this case, I want you to look at yellow. Yellow are the, are the geosciences. And what you notice here with yellow is they intertwine, it intertwines with just about every other color here, meaning the other disciplines. And what I want you to take from this is not only how connected we are, but how, how much we depend on the other domains and disciplines in order to further our work. Uh, and it's a, fun inter it's a fun interactive graphic and you can explore it. Um, uh, and it has a really neat uh, 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 speaker that gives you some fun stories that go with all of that content. Um, also in the work they did in 2019, they mapped the papers and how many authors and where the authors were from. And what I want you to note here is we nearly have no more single author papers. I mean, compared to the body of science and research that's being published, it's very small and continuing to get smaller. It, it really just talks about how complex our world is and how we are uh, also international and growing. So multinational, that's your international teams, that's the orange, growing and growing. Um, and the single country teams, the domestic teams, is the blue shrinking and shrinking. So, so what you can take from this is, first of all, the research that you'll do, uh, especially if you're early career or student, is not going to be by yourself. You're going to be with a team. And you're going to be in an international team, which means you need to 
know your community, not only who's sitting across the aisle from you at your lab or your uh, your offices, but you you need to actually get to know folks worldwide across different domains. It, you also are going to need to be able to discover that research worldwide, and you're going to need tools that will allow you to discover that in a way that's meaningful to you. You're going to need really good documentation to understand that research, the data, and the software. You're going to need data that's easily interoperable, such that you it doesn't really matter which team created it, no matter where you are in the world that it will actually work together and you don't have to spend an enormous amount of time fighting with your data to get it to be to work with other data sets. And you need all of this to be accessible. So I identify software being accessible, but truly all your research, all of your data also needs to be accessible and in tools that are really easy and current. Um, uh, uh, things that are valuable to you today. I give one example here, you know, I could have made it, you know, entire, uh, many, many examples, but Jupyter Notebooks are very popular as well as other tools. So just put your favorite tool that's popular here. Um, and that is relevant for your community. And don't forget, we have to make sure the licensing is clear. If we don't have licensing, we don't know how to reuse the content before us. We need to have that licensing that tells us that we can actually, uh, under what conditions we can use and reuse what's been published previously. So we need your help. Uh, we represent a society, but also a publisher. There's 23 journals. And we, we, you know, the thinking about these things at the time of publication is way too late. We really need to, to make sure that every step of the research life cycle, all the way from funding, your institution, the teams that you work on, the communities you talk to, AGU and other societies that you work with, no matter what the society, um, we all need to be thinking about these things in a way that makes sense and is collaborative. So in our talk, we will uh, walk you through what publications are looking for. It'll have an AGU bend to it, but it will definitely be something that is common across most publishers or they're moving this direction. So we'll, it may be a preview for some publishers. Uh, what to do with models and simulation, a little bit hard because those are uh, usually more complex and larger. Uh, we'll talk about the resources we have available openly on AG, for AGU and the blog, which we try to do in community to make it easy to access. We'll talk about tools that you can use to help optimize discovery, citations that will get into persistent identifiers and linking um, and uh, some selection of repositories. And then uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence are a really big deal right now. And the way you prepare your data and the way you think about it is really relevant. And we'll talk about data readiness around AI and then what's happening around um, the upcoming data fair and tools that you'll be able to have access into the future. So Chris, I think you are going to take over. Yeah, so next slide. Um, speaking of working together. So um, one of the things that we did recently um, at AGU was some, um, and I think, um, a variety of places are, are in the same situation um, where this is an evolving space and you might have content every in you know, different places throughout um, your organization. We recently worked with um, uh, our community, um, our staff and, and other, uh, you know, just, just a, a wide range of people to really consolidate um, our guidance. So try to create a streamlined um, resource, a location where we could point to um, to help guide our authors through particular aspects of um, sharing their, their data and software. So typical questions like what data needs to be available, um, repository selection is um, one we often um, uh, um, handle as well, um, availability statements, data and software citation, uh, the sample numbers, which we'll talk about later, and then the help desk, which actually um, allows us to, to field um, more questions and refine our, our guidance. Um, so this is a, a, a resource that our authors are sort of increasingly using to um, help uh, format these different sections of their paper. So uh, next, next slide. Um, part of that is um, we, we really want to guide our, um, our researchers in um, doing more with describing uh, the data and software behind uh, their papers. 
Um, so instead of parachuting them in, and I think this is a common scenario that, that you've, you've seen, maybe you still see, um, but we're working towards improving is um, this whole concept of dropping an author into uh, just a homepage URL or not even actually providing a link of any sorts and just saying data, we, we use data from this, from this uh, organization um, or you know, we, we use data from this website um, what we would like to do is, is guide them as best as possible. And so often that means um, a, a direct link, a DOI, a persistent identifier is often you know, the best solution. <clears throat> but sometimes you can't often do this because um, repositories and, and, and other uh, services out there are in a variety of different, uh, um, provided different functionality sometimes. And that, that can mean um, you know, fun, just a database that you have to, create, uh, you have to select certain features, or it can even involve um, translation. Um, so, you know, we, we have increasingly a, a number of uh, Chinese repositories being used. And so you need to guide, um, you need to guide readers um, through your um, availability statement to the data. So saving them time, saving, saving everyone. Um, and so next, uh, next slide. So what are we talking about here? Um, there's re really two, two um, aspects here. So the availability statement, we, I know um, it's commonly referred to as data availability statement, but we, we feel like there's much more in there. So software, um, and, and you'll hear more about notebooks as well, but it, there are other objects that um, we, we can include and, and cite. Um, so trying to provide as much information to um, and 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 uh, citation information in in your availability statement, um, but also citing it. So citing it in your reference references section, and th and this is a this is a place where we often I think we'll be working more and more with our authors because I think there's just two two separate things going on here: culture, uh, whether authors uh, uh, feel like they they is it fine to cite their data or software, or technically possible. And so next next slide. So um, wh why, so which data and what software? Um, so data used by, you know, from others, so they can get credit, uh, your own data, so you can get credit. Um, data supports your research findings. So usually the process, they're aggregated data, um, analyzed data. Um, and then of course, software, this is something we're stressing even more. Um, so uh, next slide. And what is included in an availability statement? You can see, um, you know, the different aspects that we're asking for um, when people sort of mention um, data or software. Um, so, um, you know, repository name, uh, the context, so the description. Um, really, what what can uh, what can someone find when they go to that link? Um, what are they What are they expecting? Uh, licensing information is not so common, but we're in, you know asking for that as well. Um, and then in-text citation sort of encourages the citation and your references. Um, and then also with software versioning and a link to your platform. So that's also besides the preserved version of your software, um, which you can you know, provide a DOI, also the development environment where you can go and see where the software is being act actively developed. Uh, so next slide. So we have an example here. Um, this is this one's from one of our journals, Water Resources uh, Research. Um, and so next next uh, slide, um, you can see in a, a sample availability statement. Uh, this is one of our older <laughs> availability statements. As I mentioned, we're evolving as we speak. The the these availability statements, the open research section where they live and. Um, AGU journals is, is evolving and getting better and better as we work with our authors. This one is actually pretty, it's pretty good. Um, you can see that um, they are just sort of describing the data where they can find it in a repository. Um, so in this case, it's Dryad. Um, and then um, they, they also have this, uh, this in-text citation, but you can see they're using a DOI direct link uh, that's cited, citable um, in, hello? Oh, okay. Sorry, there was a message that popped up. <laughs> so, so, um, so you can see that you have a DOI and you have a citation. So, next, next slide. 
And you can see the, the citation in the references section. Um, so you can get this, this in this case, this is this this can be properly indexed and you can get credit for um, for this this data. So next slide. And then um, on the Dryad page, you can see all the sort of descriptive information around um, around that data. So um, the the author information, uh, the title, um, the citation, the abstract. Um, but you can also see that Dryad provides some of this um, this additional metrics information. That's also um, something that authors are are interested in and who's who's cited it. Um, so this is a, 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 an example. So next slide. <clears throat> so what do you mean credit for my data and software? You, you maybe find that this is a surprising uh, question, but it's not actually. Um, again, we, we're, um, we're working with authors to sort of um, move people along to thinking that this, this is actually a thing. You can actually get credit for your data and software that it's actually, you know, the culture of of, um, of, of citing is actually possible and, and it's technical, technically possible. Um, so, you know, software, research data on software, uh, why, why, would you, why would you wanna do this? So it's important scientific contributions. Um, you, the, so you wanna get, of course, you wanna get credit um, uh, for the data, the software that, that you've developed. Um, it's also becoming more and more a part of the, the promotion and tenure process and honors and awards. So you can recognize the, the value. Um, you can get uh, credit in that, that sense. Um, and then uh, funders, of course, are asking more and more uh, for, uh, for you to do this. Um, and so next, next slide. And uh, so what does it do for me? Um, so it's, it's easier to value it. So, um, you know, uh, your peer reviewers can actually review the, the data as long as it's a uh, sort of preserved and curated um, better. Um, and it can be discovered in different ways, not just solely through the paper, but it can also be part of um, the, the larger sort of ecosystem, the scholarly graph, and you can, you can uh, find it in other ways. Um, and, and ultimately, again, uh, potentially get credit or, you know, find, as, as Shelly was saying, um, can actually lead to new collaborations. Um, your data will be, be preserved as part of the scientific rec record and linked. Um, so this is also another thing where, you know, your data might not be lost or, you know, your software might be lost, but it, it'll be preserved as well. So uh, next slide. And then, um, there, this is just one publication, but I'm sure um, there are many more out there of, of, of citing the benefits of, of uh, citing your data and software uh, that it can actually lead to um, uh, more, you know, more likely to be cited by others. Um, and, and you can see this percentage impact. Um, so that's another reason why you would want to uh, link to your data and your software as well uh, to in, improve your, your impact. Um, so. Uh, next slide. Um, and and so, how do you do this? Um, well, we you know we often say um, trusted community accepted repository to preserve your data and software in a place um, uh, in a repository such as this, um, which provides this sort of citation capabilities, um, and often that means the DOI. Um, and then um, you can you can include that citation in your references section um, as well in, in your paper. Uh, so next slide. And um, we, it, it, it's funny. There's sort of two things about this slide. The first, uh, if you don't know about citation.crosscite.org, um, it's a really helpful resource um, for formatting um, your your citations. Uh, we've heard a lot of great things from authors about this, but the other thing is you can actually see um, the the citation again, the example, and it's an it's it's an opportunity for us to highlight something that's new with AGU, and it actually will help with um, indexing uh, citations. But it's also this um, this bracketed description, and it's actually you know included in APA um, citation uh, styles. 
but it, it, it's something that helps the indexes as well as far as identifying whether this is data, software, computational notebook collection or other um, sort of research objects. Uh, so that's an, a nice example. And this is something we've just recently rolled out as well. So next slide. Um, so again, um, here's our, our updated um, guidance. If you want to go to um, data and software for authors at, at AGU, um, I think the other thing to highlight here is the, the data help at agu.org um, email. It's not just for AGU authors, actually. It could be, you know, if anyone on this call is, in, is, is you know, having any questions or, um, you know, has any challenges, then they can also um, reach out there. But the other thing is that we, we're hoping that at some point that this, uh, you know, drive, we, we drive this towards or more of a community option. And we might, um, well, we will speak about this uh, later on in, in the talk. Uh, so next slide. Um, another thing to mention here, and it's, just, it's already an old slide, uh, actually, <laughs> but it, it's a good one um, to, sh to show you that initially we started off um, providing um, guidance by each journal. And uh, so you can see some of the earlier, earlier journals where we uh, provided sort of the specific guidance. Um, and and uh, um, one, one thing is we'll probably end up coming back to this because there are uh, standards, um, norms for particular communities. Um, and that we'll be working on that in AGU to, to really um, you know, speak to, I think, you know, often you hear well, we use community standards and we, we want to start speaking to that in AGU and, and delving into that more of like, what are the community standards and using our sections. But um, this is how we started off. We started off with these journal, the journal specific guidance. And then next slide, um, we, we actually moved. Um, and th this, was a, this was a really um, great moment where we actually started coming together, some of the journals listed here um, and, and, and one of the people to sort of lead this is um, Peter Fox, who was actually the editor in chief of, um, of Earth and Space Science. And he uh, unfortunately passed away um, right when we were put, starting to put this together. But he, he sort of launched this, uh, this initiative to start um, doing a, a shared guidance between our journals. It made sense, right? It made sense to um, to have sort of a common, uh, re common reference, common, common uh, uh, guidance document. And so now um, um, it's mainly used by all of our journals now, except maybe one or two as we're still talking about um, some, some challenges around proprietary software and, and data. Um, but for most part, HGU has moved many of its um, journals to a common uh, shared guidance now. Um, and it's available at, at data.agu.org. Um, but yeah, this is this, and then here's the citation here as well. Um, so next, next slide. And then uh, the other thing to to uh, mention here is uh, um, one of the areas where we have a, a good deal of conversation <laughs> is uh, around models and simulations. Um, and, and, you know, this is, this is an area where it's becoming increasingly complicated with, uh, um, you know, data in, in very, it, it can be actually not just on one research computing cluster, it can be in many places and, and the software can be in many places as well. Um, and, it, you know, there's just a, the, the complexity is, is growing with, with, the, with these, um, these larger projects. And so, um, this is one project uh, out of um, NCAR that's looking at how can we actually, um, what are the best practices for preserving and, and uh, replicating some of this model data. And they have a lot of um, information there to help work through this, but we also have um, the practicality, the, 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 the here and now to deal with at AGU. And so we actually get these questions and we've actually had to work through them in our um, data and software um, sharing guidance for authors of here's the, here's sort of the good, the better and best type of approach to um, preserving um, your, your data, your software, um, and just trying to provide the best guidance we can um, as our authors sort of grapple with how do they best share this information. 
Um, so I recommend uh, that you have a look at that resource. Um, it, it was very informative to, to um, our work as well. So next slide. And that's Shelly. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you. Um, at, so this uh, resource, um, which is at, at the very top, data.agu.org slash resources, Chris designed this. And uh, what I, what I want to highlight for you here is, first of all, it's on GitHub, which means that you can um, uh, do a pull request or you can provide a comment and actually contribute to the thinking and updates that happen as we continue to evolve as a big community, not only in the earth and space sciences, but all, the, you know, every, all of us. Uh, many of these resources, it doesn't really matter what your domain is. Um, I think for the, those of you who are participating from, uh, you know, sister and brother domains around the geosciences, you'll see that this makes a lot of sense to you too. Um, so you're welcome uh, to take a look, um, reference it, uh, use it, pull it into your own resources. Everything is open here. Uh, everything, um, there's no... Other than the blog post, there's no content that is uh, 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 that you can't actually cite or build upon or give uh, attribution for. So, so there's a lot of materials here. Uh, and again, we have the email at the bottom. This email goes to Chris and I, primarily Chris, uh, giving him credit because he does the bulk of the answers for that email. Uh, and it, it's always there's always something to learn. There's always something to dig into. Uh, but the the things that we've come that we've been working on with the community and vetted broadly are in the resources section. Uh, also on this resource is the blog, and the blog. And I think there's a slide. Oop, I think it, not yet. Um, let me back up. the The blog will uh, is actually things that we're getting a lot of questions on, but we don't yet have a common answer. Uh, so what we do is we try to give you the best information we have. Uh, at the moment, knowing that it will likely change or we know about things that are changing, uh, but there's, it's not settled yet. So this is helping us navigate uh, a number of topics um, and it's, it's been nice to have as a resource and share it with others. Okay, so let me talk to you about these resources. Some of them I'm going to highlight here. The first one is about digital presence. So this is you, the researcher, and what it's like uh, what you know when I go look for you online, how I see you, and this is you curating your presence. It starts with the orchid as your hub, and then uses the persistent identifiers that link to your orchid, and talks about how how to optimize those. So I've included a few slides from this presentation today, which we'll walk through very briefly. But then we also have we we encourage you to go look at that and get yourself optimized so that collaboration and discovery of your research and your uh, research products are as optimal as possible. Software citation. This is so popular. Um, how, how do you do it? Where do you look for it? What are the inf What's the information? Chris, has, Chris did this one and it's really fantastic. Five tips for citing your research software. You get a checklist and you get uh, a recording. You get that for the digital presence as well. We're trying to give you all a very short checklist and then uh, something uh, a little bit more substantial, about 15 minutes of video to help walk you through all the concepts if you're interested. Um, but if you're not interested, you get a you get the one page checklist. Uh, the guidance for AGU authors. This is truly for any author. Uh, so, so how do you cite a Jupyter notebook within your paper? This is current practice. Uh, we are continuing to work on uh, other tools for uh, using Jupyter notebooks more in a more integrated way. But at the, this is what we have available right now within the AGU publications. And I believe it's doable uh, within any journal and any publication. It is pretty straightforward and it should be supported by any publisher. And for those of you who like are, we did not forget you. Uh, here is your guidance uh, of something very similar, but tuned to your community and to your platform. Uh, so we're delighted uh, AGU hosts both 
uh, folks that love Python and Jupyter Notebooks as well as R scripts and R Markdown. Uh, samples. So uh, yes, I am definitely on the team, uh, on the support team for the, the uh, International Geo Samples and the iSamples group. Uh, what I can tell you is uh, about a year ago, we had a, a meeting where I asked for help on what it would look like to cite a, uh, a sample within a paper such that automated attribution could take place. Uh, and, and citation would be uh, um, valuable to the community. And the team is working on that. Uh, we, I've seen some early drafts uh, and hopefully we'll have something in the new year that we can go ahead and put here on the resource page. And I, hopefully you'll see it other places as well, but there's a lot of really great work happening uh, and I'm really excited about it. And I can't wait to be able to share something with you uh, once those teams uh, work themselves uh, through their vetting process. Um, and, and Leslie, I'm gonna look to you for any additional adjustments that you'd like to make on that statement. Um, so here is the uh, data.agu.org page. This is where you'll land if you type in that website. This is the, we, it's a simple page. You've got a blog post, you've got resources, and we have a link to the data fair as well. So it's very simple, not very, very easy to use. Uh, you can see that very large data is a challenge. We have, uh, we have a blog post there. Um, you can see there's a, the digital presence is there and there's a couple others. If you would like to see a resource or a blog post, please ask. We have a number in the works and if somebody asks, likely we will we'll change the order of things that we're doing to accommodate that. Um, because if you wanna know, then likely you have peers that also want to know. Um, so, so please do reach out and express uh, challenges that you have. So let's talk about digital presence. So I told you what that, that is. I will repeat it because some of you may have been drifting. So come back, come back. Uh, digital presence, this is about you, your research, and optimizing how you are discovered. And we feel that that's really important in order for you to uh, uh, you know, have the, the most opportunity to be uh, recognized for your work, discovered by others, uh, and uh, for you to, to gain a network and collaboration opportunities uh, and meet other folks that are uh, working in the same area, worldwide, internationally. So this is, this is how things are connected across all of those types of digital objects, your publications, your data sets, your software, et cetera. So why do you care? Chris said this, I'm gonna say it again. When you publish your data and software and then cite it in your paper, you actually can increase the citation of your paper. And we do have research on this. It's not a guarantee, but it does increase the possibility. And then you also open up yourself to additional collaborators, other domains, and these also play into open, open science practices. So first, you, so if you don't have an ORCID, oh my goodness, get one, get one right away. Uh, this is critical for to be the hub for your entire digital presence. Um, and we have on our website uh, information about how to do that. So uh, I won't get into it here, but uh, get yourself an ORCID. Uh, here's mine. Uh, this, what it is, it's not your CV. Think of it as a linking hub where you put some basic information, like I keep my bio here. I can assure you my bio is used for most digital versions of uh, when I give a talk, people come here and get my bio. This is where they find it primarily. Um, and then make sure your email, so, so you have control of what information is public, uh, especially if you're an early career researcher or a student, I'm gonna give you a tip right now. Put two emails, associated with your ORCID. One is your personal email that is likely not to change. And one is your university email that might change if you, uh, as you progress in your uh, studies and in your career. And you want them both because you always want access to your ORCID. Okay, that makes sense, right? You can just make one public. You don't have to make both public, but you can access your ORCID through either. So this is very important. Um, Okay, that was my, my tip for those who are uh, early in their career. 
Great. So here is a paper and look at this. It's one that I published with Leslie Wyborn. Uh, uh, I don't think it's our most recent publication, but it is one that I'm very proud of. And it combines two communities, the geosciences and chemistry. Uh, we, we do have a lovely relationship with IUPAC um, and uh, Leslie works within geochemistry, which uh, uh, was one of the reasons it was important to have her as a co-author. And you can see uh, in this case, data science only wanted orchids for the, um, the corresponding authors. So um, what I've learned since is we could have forced the orchids in for Leslie and Nancy and Ian, and we should have. Um, so that's my, my tip to you, make sure orchids are associated with every single author. Um, and you can see that here with a little green dot uh, that says ID, that indicates that the orchid is associated with that author. The other thing you need to know is it might be a new word for many of you. So I really want you to pay attention. Crossref is the agency that assigns DOIs to publications, primarily English speaking publications. There are other agencies for Japanese and Chinese um, and uh, Korean and a, variety, a few other languages, but uh, Crossref is your primary uh, DOI registration agency for English publications. Why does this matter? Because they are the ones that make the references to your data connected to your ORCID and connected to your publication. And you'll have an opportunity to let them help you populate your ORCID. You want to do that. And if you didn't recognize the term Crossref before, th this is, these are folks that you can trust populating your ORCID profile. This is a good thing. It will save you a lot of typing and you'll thank me later and tell all your friends. Um, all right, so to get all of that information, to create those links with Crossref, to make sure you have all of your links as robust as possible, uh, you want to grab this checklist. So you'll find it on the data.agu.org page. These are the direct DOIs to the checklist and tutorial, but you can get them from um, data.agu.org. Um, and then please walk through it and share it with everyone you know. It does not matter what domain you're in. It absolutely does not matter. Let me say it again. Does not matter what domain you're in. It will help everybody, every researcher you know, okay? Tell everyone. They should just come get this and do this. Okay. Chris, this is the big handover. <laughs> Thank you. And, I, and you, and you had a question. Down to the end. And you had a question in the chat actually about what about data site, and I, you know, I think that that, that that's actually something I do speak to in the digital presence. Uh, but we can get yes, to that. Yes, we later. do. We do get to that as well. So, so go <laughs> go do the checklist, and we'll get to data site as well. Yes. Um, but so this is um, this is something that I, I think uh, through um, also through Leslie's encouragement. To, but this is also. Uh, Something that we're we're also working on, and so as far as you know, always improving our guidance. Um, but AI data readiness um, is something that's actually come up, um, and you've heard. Um, I, I we we recently heard this at the Research Data Alliance, so and at the National Institute of Health uh, in the U.S. Um, and the USGS, which is like two examples that said we're working towards AI readiness. Um, you may have heard this. <laughs> In, in other places, um, there's actually a cluster, um, a group that uh, um, works, is working on a checklist uh, related to this topic at um, ESIP. Uh, um, so this is a, a Earth Systems in Information Partners uh, um, group um, that meets regularly to work through how they can sort of improve this checklist. Um, they're surveying um, the community at the moment um, and uh, hopefully the checklist will be available. Um, uh, but like, next slide. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't necessarily point you to the, the, it's in a draft form right now, but I pulled out um, all the sort of elements um, that they're looking at in the checklist. And you can probably see a lot of familiar, um, familiar topics here about you know, some of the things they can do as far as um, documentation and access. Um, um, but you know, I think this checklist is gonna be really invaluable um, to, um, to authors, you know, to researchers that, that are um, working through sort of the challenges of how they can make their, their uh, 
data AI ready. And you know, this, this really um, in many ways continues a lot of the, the work that we have been doing that we provided in, in our guidance. But it, you know, we, we'll obviously um, update it as, as, uh, as this progresses. But we thought we'd share sort of the early, um, the early preview of, of some of this information. And you know, just another thing that we're tracking if anyone's interested, I can, um, they can e email us too at datahelp at ag.org and we can provide the, um, the draft, uh, a link to the, to the draft copy of, of the checklist as well. So uh, next, next slide. So um, mentioned this earlier too, like our, our um, uh, we have our own um, help desk, but we also have, um, the, the, the grander, the greater help desk, which is a community resource um, that's, um, that we partner with ESIP on and, and, and EarthCube, but it also travels. It travels around to different uh, um, venues. Um, next venue will be the AGU uh, fall meeting, which is coming up in uh, uh, two weeks or <laughs> just feels like it's coming very soon, um, but it, it'll be right around the corner very soon. Um, but, um, yeah, one thing we do with this as a community is we provide resources um, from the various services that are out there in, in earth and space sciences. Uh, we have volunteers that sort of help and, and answer questions at various times, or they provide resources to the community. Um, there's the physical um, location. Oh, what happened there? <laughs> um. <laughs> but there, there's the physical location, the AGU fall meeting, where um, we'll be, you know, running various workshops or um, trainings, uh, but we'll also be do doing talks, giving talks from various community members. Um, but you can also see all this material at the, um, the, uh, the data fair link that you see here, but it's also on Twitter. So you'll see the, 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 um, the back and forth as far as the questions and, and answers um, on Twitter through the hashtag uh, data help desk and then um, HD21. But I think the, 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 one of the things to mention here too is that, um, again, we, we really want to start expanding this further and make, make the help desk a community resource. Um, we, we, you know, we, we, were, we were talking earlier about, uh, maybe this was before we even got on the webinar, about how this is a shared effort, data stewardship and um, its libraries, it's, uh, it's you know, the societies, the publishers, um, it's the repositories, um, it, you know, it's the organizations, we're all sort of working together and that, and Shelly advanced the slide at the right time, which is at the end of the day, um, it's, it's this Beatles line again with a little help from our friends. Um, we all are in this boat together, working together. And so I think, um, you know, it's very much um, on our roadmap to, to start expanding our help desk further and start working with the community um, on, on, uh, on all these challenges. So um, I think, I guess I'll leave it there. I don't know if I, we had any other slides. I think the last slide is our contact slide. Thank you, everyone. Um, <laughs> yeah, we can leave it on the Beatles slide. <laughs> Um, thank you, Chris and Shelley. Um, I guess the idea was to point you to all these emerging resources that are happening and also to show you that um, if you've got any issues, um, you can join in and um, guide Shelley and Chris as to what are the um, next lot of resources that would be useful to what you're doing in Australia. We thought that was a better way to present rather than sitting there and going through and this is how you cite a model and this is how you cite software. So we've got all those resources and we'll make these slides available. I've been putting some of the connections in. So between now and when we hand over to Natasha to help us understand um, what issues Australians may be having, uh, it's open to the audience to ask any questions of uh, Shelley and Chris directly. So does anyone have any questions they'd like to either put in the chat or just unmute yourself and put, well, put your hand up first so we can 
um, sequence the questions and ask. So does anyone have any questions about any of the material that um, Shelley and Chris presented? So I'll ask one. Um, one of the things I get asked a lot about is signing models. Um, what do you think is critical to being able to cite a model in a publication? Looks like Chris is choking. When you finish choking. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, I guess I'll start. Um, so, so a model is is really a very complex software with configuration, with forcing factors, with input data, with output data. Um, what, I, what I would do is uh, I would direct you to the resources Chris provided for the RCN. They were incredibly thoughtful. They had simple models all the way through complex IPCC models, walking through um, you know, what the contribution is to science. Uh, they even, I think they even include proprietary models and how to handle that. Um, so, so we work with AMS quite a lot, the American uh, Meteorological Society. So they have a, a number of uh, models that are, are proprietary. Um, so it, you know, it, I, I think that that is the, the, probably the best resource that gives you all of the different variations. And then when you, when it's time to actually publish based on the type of science you're doing, the recommendation for what to cite is, and they give you a recommendation. Um, if there's a rubric that they use, um, and that, that is the best resource. Um, then second best, of course, you can take a look at what we wrote, which walks you through good, better, best, depending on where your model is stored. Um, and the mo if you have control over it, of course, we want you to put it somewhere where you can get a DOI. Don't forget, uh, if you love using GitHub or GitLab, um, uh, GitHub is a really great connection to Zenodo where you can create a citation. We highly recommend that. We provide you with those resources um, and um, that would be how you would preserve the version used for your research. How'd I do, Chris? I think I'm, I, I, it was good. I, I think I'm better now. <laughs> hey, okay, Louis, good. do you have a supplementary question you'd like to ask? Louis, you've got your hand up. Ah, he's unmuted. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I was trying to click the button, nothing was happening. Um, I just wanted to sort of uh, bring up the question of, uh, which, which is a follow-up question of peer review. And I mean, it does apply, I'm thinking of it in terms of models, um, but it applies to anything that we want to count uh, as a sort of a, a as an output that gets considered for, as you pointed out, sort of the wider um, um, use of our, our stuff that's not just for more science, but also for our personal development and so on. So anyway, anything that's peer reviewed has a much higher value. Um, and I wonder what you think about of you know assigning DOIs, but also assigning a sort of a peer review status to data sets and models and and software. You know, in, the, in the same style as we do for something like Joss, you know, or one of these sort of uh, where we actually go through code and, and review it. Yeah, J Joss is a really valuable resource. Mm -hmm. And I am very familiar with that, Dan Katz and that team. Um, so I, I, I'll give you the best answer I can give you, which is, is not, we, there isn't common agreement or resources or funding yet, um, but I would agree. If, if we're able to get to the point where data and software can both be, can be peer reviewed, that would be incredibly valuable. So, um, but there are a lot of challenges to do that in today's uh, infrastructure. Uh, the majority of researchers use a general repository which provides a researcher with no support on curation or peer review in any way, shape or form. I have to tell you, it makes it very easy for you to get a DOI, which is beneficial, but it does you no benefit when it comes to reuse of your data and software. So many folks are stuck with just a general repository or a generalist repository, um, but you as researchers should actually want a repository that can help you 
with curation. What that looks like is gonna be different depending on the domain, the country, the resources, what's possible. Um, and even when you get a repository that can help you with curation, there are only certain skill sets that are gonna be available in that, that repository team that can give you some level of review. For instance, even with a, a discipline specific repository, and I'll, I think of a, one of the ones I work with a lot is BicoDemo. So that's Biological Chemistry, uh, Chemical Oceanography Data Management Office out of Woods Hole in Massachusetts. They have specialists for different types of data, but they are only comfortable looking at like um, boundaries, like, like salinity, for instance, ocean salinity. They'll look to make sure that the numbers make sense within some bounds, but they don't know the science that went into the capture of those numbers. So they can only ask the researcher, well, you know, this bit right here looks like actually maybe your columns are off because these numbers are out, you know, they're way out or they're, they're, they don't look quite right. Or it looks like the calibration of the instrument was off. Could you take a look? Um, but they're not gonna know the science that went into it. So how do we deal with that? How do we actually look at the science with the data? There are like within the US, um, the USGS and NOAA and NASA do have peer review because that data is used to make life and death decisions. So they do fund the peer review for that content before it goes out, before it goes into weather reports, before it goes into other recommendations but it's a service that's being done by that mission. And most data doesn't have access to that. So you depend then on the scientific process and by making the data right now, what we're stuck with uh, for good or bad, depending on how you look at it, is giving access to researchers, the data and software to consider and replicate or reproduce or whichever word makes sense for your research in order to determine if there's an issue or not. So it's okay, but I would agree it would be nicer if we had more funding for peer review, but that's, it's, it's just not realistic right now. And the other thing that you and I have often talked about is, can we please have some domain repositories that we can actually do this because, um, as you know, in Australia, there are many domains that just do not have right. domain specific repositories and they're reliant on generalist institutional repositories yep. or Zenodo or heaven forbid, as someone said, ResearchGate this morning. Um, look, we better move on. Uh, Natasha, do you have a quick or how about we just address, there's a question in the chat that went up early from Alex Print. Would you explain the data site for samples a little more, would one just place IGSN URLs in the reference list? I think that might be getting at the problem that you're gonna have 200 and you can't do that. Do you, Leslie, I feel like you should take that. Did you wanna talk, do you want oh. me to talk about the work we're doing on collection DOIs or do you wanna, do you wanna come at it differently? Oh, I was gonna talk about, um, yeah, there is a problem people with the fact that in a publication you can only cite is it 20 research objects there's even less for some yeah, yeah so, there isn't a number so there is a group starting in um research data alliance which um shelly and i are associated with where we're looking at what we call an aggregated doi so that you put give it all your individual samples 200 2000 whatever you've got and igsn and then you create a DOI for the aggregate that goes with the publication. And the important thing about doing it that way is that the organization, the funder, the researcher gets credit for the individual DOI, IGSN in that aggregation, but the aggregation um, is what's cited in the paper for transparent research. And then equally as well, you could also think that that same, same sample could be used in other papers and in different aggregations. And so through knowledge graphs, you can track how many times your sample or your bit of data or your bit of software is used. Um, look, in the interest of time, Natasha, I thought we could hand over to you for 
uh, you asked your question and um, I'll share my screen so we can get back to um, hopefully your presentation. Thank you. But I just have a question, which is, um, so first of all, great set of guidelines that you've got there. I think everybody, there's some good comments about that in the chat. Um, uh, sorry. Um, can you just I'll pause that for a second, Leslie? Just, yeah, I am. Yeah. Um, sorry, I can't see anybody now, so it's a bit harder. Um, what I was asking was, so you've got some guidance around the data availability statements. Um, and I just wondered, I mean, obviously different journals have different requirements for what they want you to put in a data availability statement. And I just wonder how you're able to match these up in the, in the first instance. And the second one is that, you know, data availability, data available on request is still the most common response to a data availability statement. And the second most common is it's in the supplementary section of the journal. So obviously we wanna move in the FAIR uh, landscape to more data in more repositories and that availability statement linking there like the Dryad example that Chris showed. So I'm just wondering if you're sort of, if there's an interest from AGU there in monitoring uh, a shift there. I, 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 can, I can, yeah, oh, if Chris, if you, you don't mind just for a second, I, I can tell you AGU does not allow either of those. And we have not allowed them for years. Okay. So you could not, as a researcher, now that doesn't mean that there isn't the, you know, the occasional author who's able to, uh, you know, who has some sort of circumstances where there, there needs to be a, an allowed situation. But across our journals, you cannot say data available on request. And it's been at least five years since we've said, no, that's not allowed. And data available in the supplement only three years, we've not allowed that. So that's not, we know that's not okay. So that's where we are. It's just not, not, not yeah, okay. Yeah, I can, I can add too that I, I, uh, I work um, very closely with our staff um, on training them and, uh, and um, developing sort of these checklists and, and uh, we've, you know, I can sort of confidently say that we are weeding that out almost to like, you know, a very zero percent now, like, you know, it could every, any of those kind of things come to me in the data help desk. And we actually work through how the author can actually share, you know, when, when those kind of instances come up, but it, it's specifically stated in our, in our guidance and what the authors get, you know, now. So it's like direct, direct statement saying you will not do this anymore. So it is, it is really, I, I, I haven't seen it as much since uh, I, I maybe saw a few cases when I first started, but it, I haven't seen any since. And okay. we're, we're actually advancing a great deal with like, you know, how, how, you know, how we're sort of improving with our availability statements and citations too. So it's really started yeah. turning around. Yeah, I just... And um, AGU is not the only set of journals as how many of you got 23 is it that, that have stopped doing this. Mm. Uh, I know nature science, it, just about every journal has stopped taking, um, you know, supplements or contact the author. Yep. And so that's what this was about because I have been repeatedly asked by researchers, what do I do now? They won't accept my paper unless I do something. Okay. So that's what we were trying to, doing this is show you yes this is what the barrier is but here are the resources so i think it's a good place now sorry i forgot natasha um i'll hand over to natasha because you're going to run it aren't you yeah just don't share any slides i'll just put a link in the chat so um there's a chance now for everybody to have a bit of a say around this and for us to have a discussion for about i don't know the next 15 or 20 minutes or so um so I just, we don't have to do the whole thing by Menti, but I just thought we would start with Menti. Um, let me just share my uh, screen. And uh, why do the buttons, why do the pop-ups go right over the present button? There we go. So the question, which areas are the most challenging for you or, or the researchers that you support in meeting publisher requirements? Um, and you can pick more than one. So if they're all challenging, that's very fine. 
um, just want to get an idea of if there's one area that people are struggling with more than another or if these are all evenly spread. Um, Ooh, software's winning. Yeah, software's winning. Just and data, every, everything so, else is almost even there. So, th so we have a resource on software. Whoever those 10 people are, make sure you get your fingers on that because that might help. Mm. Yes, and uh, AIDC is leading a conversation around a national st software strategy here. So that will have some related guidance too. And that information is on the ARDC website, if anybody wants that. And Paula Martinez, Martinez here is available too. She's involved in that and she can help answer the questions. Oh, it's even now. feels like a horse race of some kind, but anyway. Um, okay, so that's, that's interesting. And of course, we can't tell if uh, why people are having trouble here. So we might go to the next question now, but that gives us a pretty good idea that data and software are sort of pretty equally challenging. And then we have notebooks followed by models and samples. Uh, so what are your pain points in meeting publisher requirements for data samples and software, et cetera? So do, we don't mean published articles here, but all the other things that we've been talking about, just that Menti doesn't allow you to put them all in. So um, you can just put in, this as an open-ended question and you can just enter your, quest, uh, enter your comment, sorry, and it should scroll across the screen, I hope, as people start entering it. Yep, citing and sharing notebooks. Is that one that comes up quite a lot for you, Chris and Shelley? Yep. Yeah, that's why we have the guidance. <laughs> that's why you have the guidance, yes. Yeah, and Chris, do we have the DOI for the one, the paper that uh, that we're using as an example? That might be helpful to share here. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. What we have, actually, we, we might have two papers, right? Don't we have the one with data and software? Um, this, this was really fun. So we have an amazing set of authors who had a paper with three data sets cited and three pieces of software cited. And so we we're using that as our example and we're all taking bets that it gets, it, just by using that as the example, it's gonna be the most cited paper we have. <laughs> so it's just, I don't know, it's kind of a funny, silly behind the scenes sort of bet we've got going. Um, but then we also have one on, on a notebook that both of these Chris worked on and made sure were really great. So the credit's all his. Okay, there's a question there. If a results paper is published, can I then publish another paper for just the software? Are there, I mean, obviously you can have data papers. So are there the equivalent software papers? Yes, yes. Joss is already in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, Joss is a fantastic software paper. Great. Yep. Journal, software journal, I'm sorry, software journal. And that's where you'll get, uh, they do have peer review. So I think there's a theme in here that um, citing data and software is really hard. That seems to be one of the things that is coming up in a lot of this. Um, having data peer reviewed before making it publicly available. Um, Shelley can make comments on that. Or yeah. it's something we're working towards. Um, it's a problem in Australia because most of the big repositories, you know, you publish the data, then, sorry, you deposit your data, then it's published. And researchers want to actually um, have that data embargoed until they're sure that the paper has been accepted with the data in it. So there is a group working on that to. Um, help work with repositories to be able to facilitate um, access to data for the peer review period. Shelley, do you want to add something? That, that was just brilliant, actually. Yeah. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, and it, it's, uh, it recognizes the fact that, especially when you pick a repository that has a curation process, and it does take some time, um, that you want to time the paper with the data um, and even for those that are generalist repositories that take the data right away, that you want the data to be available for the peer review process 
but not open open more broadly. And um, yeah, we're, we, there's a lot of work that's happened in this area. RDA's done a lot of work, others have done a lot of work, but we're, um, we're digging in even further uh, and actually have uh, a recommendation coming out for vetting that will then go to the journals to help them realize how to help authors think this through because, because, because that's one resource that you have among others. It, it was pretty amazing when you think about it. We actually had to start getting a conversation going between the um, publishers and the repositories. And up until now, most conversations have been with the publishers and the researcher. And the poor repositories were getting stuck with some um, pretty unreasonable demands from either researchers or from publishers. And so we started this three-way conversation um, so that yeah, the, the repositories could actually um, have a say, because they're no longer libraries that have books on a shelf with data. They're dynamic, they're living, <laughs> and they've got to make things, things work. Gosh, you're getting a lot of comments here, Natasha. Oh, well, they're still, it's, uh, I think it's, Keep I th no, I think we've got the same ones just scrolling over now. Oh, okay. Um, but the themes I'm seeing here are citation, guidance about which repositories, and that's someone put someone put storage, but it's a similar kind of thing here. Um, also peer review and just best practice guidance that's kind of missing. So I might go on to the next uh, question, which is where do you or your researchers go to for help in meeting publisher requirements? So this might be, so um, I've just had the privilege of writing the forward for this year's State of Open Data report. And in that report, researchers say that the pretty even split really between institutional uh, libraries, repositories and publishers as places that people go to. Um, but yeah, oh, Leslie. One of, one of the solutions is scaling up, <laughs> oh Leslie. Okay, yeah. We need to scale. Scale, Leslie. Are you Does both? Everybody both have her email? Is that one <laughs> of the same answer? I don't know. <laughs> That's who I go to. <laughs> oh, Leslie, okay. you will become the help desk. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's, there's a reason Leslie's a co-author in a lot of my papers. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> uh, the library. Great. Yay. <laughs> yeah, but I was saying that it's sort of evenly split um, in the open data report, but the, the results show it's evenly split between institutional uh, libraries, repositories, and publishers. And so this kind of, there's this really, this, this shared responsibility to provide help. And yet it's quite, it's a really disconnected space. Publishers provide what they provide, institutional libraries do their thing, and repositories do something else. And we're not really, I don't see a lot of coordination between those groups in providing help for researchers. So I think that's an area that needs attention. What, what we're trying to do, I, I, I will be very honest with you, having the publisher tell you what to do with your data is something that doesn't make sense to me. In, because they are the least knowledgeable about your scientific data. Now, that being said, that is my full job at a publishing house because they knew they didn't know. So what Chris and I are doing, and he, he talked about it earlier today, is we are trying to adjust the timing from when you think about publishing your paper to more and more connected to your community. So you start thinking about your data when you're actually designing your research. Not only, you know, what data will I need, comma, followed by where will I store it, comma, followed by, oh, I'm gonna use that same metadata I used last time because that worked really well, comma. Oh, I wonder if that vocabulary I used last time is going to be the right one for me this time. Oh, I'll have to check on that. So it's it's in front of your work as opposed to at the publication side. 
So what I what I'd really like to see in this list, and don't type it just because I said it necessarily, but societies and unions weighing in on what those what you need for uh, your your resources. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Uh, that is actually all the menti poll questions I had. So we have a few minutes left, though, if people would like to talk about, you know, what might be helpful in this space now. So we've seen what the pain points, we've, we've heard what the pain points are, and we've looked at, you know, where people currently go for help. But are there suggestions for uh, what's needed in this space? Um, thinking about the participants, uh, the organizations that have contributed to this webinar too, and whether there are things that can be done, you know, by us. Uh, so to please suggest. Um, Jeff, you've got your hand up. Could you uh, unmute yourself, or are you able to unmute yourself? Or Kapola, can you unmute? Him? I think I am. Yep. Yeah, great. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yep. Jeff, definitely. Um, yeah, I just wanted to follow up my question in the chat, which um, Dave Lisinski sort of partly answered, but it's really about um, for agencies. So I'm from Geoscience Australia, so we have uh, in-house databases which you know we provide to the public. Um, so a lot of you know geochronology data, for example, that I'm involved in, is delivered that way. Um, my question, I guess, is if if and when we publish that in various different journals, and um, how do we ensure that or find out whether that repository and that way of delivering the underlying data is going to be acceptable to a particular journal? Um, or, or and are there ways of essentially getting our, our databases and delivery mechanisms accredited in some way so that that becomes an acceptable way of um, of, de of delivering the data sets? Um, I could answer that because I've obviously really thought about it a lot. The problem is, that, um, Jeff, is if you give a reference to the whole database, right, you're not actually referencing the data that goes with that publication for transparency, etc. The reviewer needs to know which part of that big database you have used to create, you know, to, to do that paper. So again, considering they're such small volumes, what some groups are doing is, as we talked about these aggregated data sets. So this is a data set that goes with this publication. And um, then you give it a DOI and I'm sure given it's not big volumes we're talking about that maybe what GA could do is in a catalog have this is the data set that goes with it with a DOI right because that then means that anyone who picks up your paper in the next you know five to ten years can get the exact data set that was used the other way is that if you have generated the data from your database um then you can actually save the query. So I question the database on this date. This is the query I used, provided someone from external, because again, we're about reproducibility of science. Someone from external can um, run that query on your database and have the exact data set replicated. So there's just been a paper published um, in Data Science Journal on you know, how to um, site data from dynamic data sets. It's not easy to do it, I can assure you. Um, could I answer that um, yes. also feeding on from that? So Jeff, you have, I mean, whenever a database or a data set from a database is released at GA, it is supposed to be released and published, so it should be an ECAT. So that's essentially a subset of the database that exists in our in our Oracle systems. If you want to create one just for an individual paper, as Leslie suggested, that's fine. You just publish it in ECAT, you give us the data set, it goes into our repository, and then that can be provided with the DOI to the publisher. And we're in the process of getting our core trust seal uh, certification. So we will be recognized 
and should be uh, should be recognized by all the publishing houses. Um, Thanks, David. That's really good to hear. There's an American. Hi, Alan. Alan Pope from the US has asked. Has a it question. going? Yeah. Let let the Australians ask question first if you have other questions. But it was I, such I an interesting of... topic that I thought I'd join and, and ask. <laughs> well, just quickly, and then we better head to wrap up. Okay, so. Shelley, he's one of yours, you can have him. Yeah, so I'll just say the question out loud is like, this is great disciplinary information, um, but I'm coming from a polar research background. Um, we do work with a lot of Australians as well, um, but I'm curious about like regional questions around best practice for management, data discovery and things like that, if you have any thoughts on, on that that crosses disciplines, but might be focused by, yeah, a location. So for me, what I would do is draw you to the work we're going to get started on next year, which will go discipline by discipline and polar, of course, um, uh, having its own cross domain challenges, but unified on location. Um, uh, but but you have done so much. I, I'm not. It, it would be interesting to see what's already in place and what's missing. Um, but yeah, Alan, that would that would be great. So so we're going to start with hydrology. Um, it is fairly progressed. Um, so there's a lot of resources. And then uh, we're going to test out our methodology on them. So it's more of a, a method ch check. So we'll do that early in 2022. And then start to, um, if, you, if you'd like to nominate Polar to go next. Uh, and the idea would be we, we would uh, talk you know, across international community on what makes sense for uh, things that would go in your data management plan what data, what metadata, what vocabulary, where do you want to put it, under what conditions, you know, based on the different types of repositories that are available, you know, how would you make your selections such that a researcher doesn't have to guess that their community says, here are the things that we recommend and it's coming from the community. Um, and then that can be easily shared with institutions, it can be shared with funders and it makes a community have more of a cohesive plan. Okay, well, look, I'm getting text messages from Natasha that it's time to wrap up. Sorry, Natasha, I had to dob you in. <laughs> um, we really were flying blind on how to run this webinar. We were hearing a need that people didn't quite know what to do. Um, and so we kind of put this together because as some of you know, I work closely with AGU and I knew a lot of the work that Shelley and um, Chris were doing, and I wanted to bring it to Australia, knowing that it would also suit environment, health, et cetera. And so this was just kind of starting the conversation. Um, I'm not sure whether we met your needs. We did have up to 99 people at one stage. Um, and so if you've got any follow up or any other questions or suggestions as to how we could continue this conversation, um, there is the email address on this slide, contact at ardc.edu.adu. Um, I'd very much like to thank Paula Martinez and Joe Saville, who behind the scenes helped get this off the ground and get it organised. The support from NCI Oscope and TURN is appreciated as well. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, and thank Shelley and Chris for taking the time out to do this. Um, I can't remember what time it is over there at the moment, but I think it's 9 p.m. So they've actually stayed up late to do this for us. And I'd like to um, thank them sincerely for um, introducing all the work that they're doing. So um, thank you everyone. And um, the Paul of the recording and um, notes from this will be publicly available off the um, ARDC website in the not too distant um, future. So thank you everyone.